Where are they at? You guys stand up. Louie and Lonnie are going to be leaving, headed for uh, Memphis and then Louisiana. They are some of our missionaries in the Philippines. Louie has been there for eight years. He's from this church. Louie and Lonnie have been married for six. They just had their anniversary, so give them a hand. They're doing a good work in the Philippines, and so uh, we, we support them from this church. I, other people do too, but anytime you want to give towards them, just say Louie and Lonnie. We forward anything you give towards the missionaries that we support. Now, not Billy, Bob, and Frank, but I mean anybody that we support, anytime you want to give towards them, uh, we will forward that to them. And I need to put up another list of all the people that we support, but they're doing a good work in the Philippines. And so I just wanted you to know who they are. Uh, you might try and meet them while they're here. They're going to be here for a few months, but they're traveling a lot. So I really encourage you to do that. Amen? Amen. All right. I'm going to read you something that's got nothing to do with what I'm preaching. How about that? Um, I gave this to my kids. I have two grown kids, both with children. I have three uh, grandsons, thank God. But I gave this to them at Christmas. It just came out of my heart, and I just thought it was worth reading. Uh, by the way, it's what I have learned about marriage and parenting. How many of you know it's pretty short? <laughs> what I have learned about marriage and parenting. I gave this to them Christmas 2020. You never have it figured out. Stay humble in your attitude. Never have someone in between you and your spouse. Never talk confidentially to someone, even me, about your spouse. Have no secrets from your spouse. Talking about them to others will separate you from them as well as separate your spouse from whoever you talk to. Talk to them. Jesus said a man leaves his father our, our, and mother, our family, and is joined to his wife, our husband. <clears throat> you can never be joined if you do not leave. It does not mean leave physically. It means make your allegiance to your spouse above all other people, including your children. The best thing you can do for your children's stability is to love their other parent. It brings a security to them. When Becky's mother was dying, I decided to tell her I would never leave her daughter or hurt her on purpose. I said, I would, I'll never leave her and I'll never hurt her on purpose. That's a simple promise that you can keep. Your children will become mirrors of you. What you say and do matters. What you tell them is irrelevant. They are following your example. Be what you want your children to become. Do first what you want them to do. They are watching and listening to every detail. The eyes of man are never satisfied. Love is a commitment and a decision that affects your emotions. Before I read this, I'm going to read this again. I'm thinking of this in the context of being faithful to your spouse. So in, in light of that, the eyes of man are never satisfied. The eyes of women are never satisfied either. <laughs> Love is a commitment and a decision that affects your emotions. It is not an emotion. Love is not an emotion. Your emotions will follow love, but they will also chase fantasies. Live from your heart, not your eyes. My children were taught that mom and dad were not the final authority. Truth existed before we did. Things are right and wrong because God said they were. Truth is not true because people made it up or the majority decided. The majority is usually wrong. I cannot create my own reality. Something is not true because I say or think it is. You okay? Give faith in God and even hearing. Show children the whole truth before you try to influence what they believe. Let them hear both sides. Truth always rises to the top. I am under authority. And that is the basis for my authority. Never expect your children to rise above the character you display. Never expect your children to rise above the character that you display. Doesn't matter what you say. They're following you. Love and forgiveness rule the day. Accept forgiveness from God and others freely and give it without strings. You will need it yourself again someday. Amen. It's interesting, I'm refinishing a table in my garage, little by little by little, it's an oak table. So we were at Lowe's, and Becky and I got separated. She was way on the other side of Lowe's, so she called me. 
She said, where are, you at? where are you at? And I said, I'm over here looking at the strippers. How <laughs> I many you know there's a pause on the phone? What? what? It's like, wait, the paint strippers. She told me I have to tell you guys that, so that's her fault. <laughs> I'm going to start a series today, and I'm going to teach a little different perspective because I really need to lay a foundation for where I'm going in the coming weeks. I called it Kingdom Come. Did your mom ever say that? You're going to do that till Kingdom Come. You guys ever hear that growing up? I didn't know at the time what it meant. Basically, it's the idea that this is going to go on forever. Um, the key is, though, I'm talking about the kingdom of God or how to change the world, how to really change the world. It's safe to say that everybody has an idea of how to change the world. The Beatles said, love is all there is, you know, love one another, and that's biblical. And, you know, everybody says, well, it's political. It's either Republican or Democrat or Independent or whatever. Or it's a system economically. It's either capitalism or socialism or communism. And every ism will someday be a wasm. And I have an opinion about politics. I have an opinion about economics. I have a lot of opinions. But the only thing that's going to change the world is Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God. Amen. Amen. There was a, a song, it's interesting, from the 80s that says, everybody wants to rule the world. Everybody wants to rule the world. And when I turn on my, I don't watch a lot of news, maybe a YouTube clip, and then I, t I turn it off and I can't stand it, but I'll see headlines. And it's just almost unbelievable. You know, one side's bribed and the other side's doing something freaky in, a, in the theater. And it's like, it's, it's, if we are putting our hope in that basket, and you think getting the right guy in office is going to fix this mess? You're really wrong. And you're going to be really frustrated. We have the answer, but it's not that. I have a strong opinion, and I vote, and I do all sorts of stuff. I'm involved. We should be salt and light. We should do business till he comes. But at the end of the day, Jesus focused on the thing that would really make a difference. And that was the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is what Jesus focused on. He said, if my kingdom were of this world, my subjects would fight. But I'm here aiming at the real target, <clears throat> the heart of men and women. If I can change the heart of men and women, they will change the world. They will change the world. If their hearts can be changed, they will change the world. They tried to make him king once, and it's like, what good would that do? If I'm the political ruler of the world, what good would that do? He said, i got to go for what really matters. The problem is not exterior. The problem is a heart problem. We all need heart surgery. Isn't that right? The kingdom of God is heart surgery. It's displacing the old king and putting in a new king. It's a transfusion. I'm translated, transfused from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. It's supernatural. Everybody say supernatural. And there's a lot of things I could talk about, what people think is the answer. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just look at the whole thing from what Jesus said. What Jesus said is what matters. So the first thing is, the kingdom is coming. The kingdom is coming physically. In the Old Testament, that's what they were looking forward to. In Acts 1, they said, Lord, is it, is it now? Is this when the kingdom comes? It's legitimate for Jewish people to just be looking forward to the messianic ruler. Revelation 20 says it's going to be a thousand years when Jesus Christ rules the world. No Congress, no United Nations, no Supreme Court. Yeehaw! It's okay to have one ruler when they're perfect and they're Jesus. That's the only theocracy I'm looking for is when Jesus rules the world. He's going to do that. That's coming. And they looked for that in the Old Testament, but they didn't realize the mystery of the ages in the New Testament when there was going to be a time when the kingdom would come spiritually before it came physically. The kingdom is here now. The kingdom is coming, but the kingdom is here. It's now, but not yet. We're living in the presence of the future. You can have the kingdom in your life to the degree that you let the king rule your life. You okay? I'm not going to talk much about the end times because I just wrote a book about that. 
And I'm not going to go there much because there's coming, coming a time when Jesus is physically going to rule. But you know what? God was always the king of the universe. Before he ever said, let there be light, he was always the boss. Isn't that right? When he made earth, he could have just ruled it. But for some reason, he wanted to make man and women to bear his image. And together they do that. Not just man and not just women, but together they reflect the image of God. And he gave them dominion. He put them in charge. I mean, he literally said, you're the boss of this thing. Make it happen. Isn't that right? They were going to take uh, dominion on God's behalf and be God's co-rulers. Why would God let men and women co-rule with him? Wow, I wouldn't have trusted them, but he did. Isn't that right? In the beginning, God. Here's what it says in Psalm 8. Psalm 8, verse 1. O Lord, our Lord, your majestic name fills the earth. Your glory is higher than the heavens. You have taught children and infants to tell of your strength, silencing your enemies and all who oppose you. When I look at the night sky and see the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars you set in place, what are mere mortals that you should think about them? You could say, when I think about the Grand Canyon, when I think about Mars, when I think about the stars, the moon and the stars you set in place, what are people? Why people? Why did you entrust so much of yourself to people? What are mere mortals that you should think about them? Human beings that you should care for them? For you made them only a little lower than God. Some translations say angels. The Hebrew word is Elohim. You made them a little lower than Elohim and crowned them with glory and honor. You gave them charge of everything you made, putting all things under their authority, the flocks and the herds and the wild animals, the birds in the sky, the fish in the sea, and everything that swims the ocean currents. O Lord, our Lord, your majestic <clears throat> excuse me, name fills the earth. So God really gave authority to men and women. Men and women really gave authority to the devil. He usurped the authority. Man was always trying to make it on his own. You guys have never been that way, right? They said, you know, the devil said, why don't you get to decide what's right and wrong? Who's he to tell the big you what to do? What right does he have to rule your life? You are the great you. Why would you have to listen to him? It's like the great philosopher and hymn writer Billy Joel said, it's my life, take care of your own life and leave me alone. He summed up the human condition. How dare you tell me what to do? Isn't that right? And then in Genesis 11, they built a tower of Babel to make a name for themselves. They were trying again, always trying to get out from underneath the rulership of God. That happened in the garden, and it spread to mankind. There was a rebellion, and God literally gave it to man, and man literally gave it to the devil. It says this in Genesis. I'm sorry, it's in Psalm 2. Why are the nations so angry? Why do they waste their time with futile plans? The kings of the earth prepare for battle. The rulers plot together against the Lord and against his anointed one, our Christ, our Messiah. Let us break their chains, they cry, and free ourselves from slavery to God. But the one who rules in heaven laughs. What we're saying is, how dare you tell me what to do? The one who's, who rules in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Then in anger he rebukes them, terrifying them with his fierce fury. For the Lord declares, I have placed my chosen king on the throne in Jerusalem on my holy mountain. The king proclaims the Lord's decree. The Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I become your father or today I revealed you as my son. Only ask and I will give you the nations as your inheritance. The whole earth as your possession. You will break them with an iron rod and smash them like clay pots. Now then, you kings, act wisely. Be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with reverence, fear, and rejoice with trembling. Submit to God's royal son. I wonder who that is. Amen. So immediately God said, I'm going to send the seed of a woman and he's going to crush your head. You're going to bruise his heel. So the battle was on. The fight was on. Man had given authority of the earth over to the devil. And so there was a promise that it was coming a Messiah. And throughout the Old Testament, the Jewish people were looking for this Messiah. They still are. Today it's Yom Kippur. It starts at sunset tonight. Yom Kippur is the Jewish day of atonement. In the Old Testament, it was the time when the uh, high priest would go into the Holy of Holies once a year, and he would lay out on the altar the blood of the, for the people's sins. Thank God we don't have to do that, because Jesus did that in heaven once for all. He put away sin 
once for all. But they were looking forward to this time. It's legitimate that they were looking forward to this. Even the disciples said, Lord, are you at this time going to do that? Is this the kingdom? Is this what's coming? So they were looking for a physical kingdom. And everybody say, a physical kingdom is coming. Isn't that right? But here's what's interesting. The Bible does say that the God of this world is Satan. 2 Corinthians 4, 2, I'm, yeah, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians 4, 4. Satan, the God of this world, it says this in Ephesians 2. The devil, the commander of the powers of the unseen world. People say, well, I'm not sure if I believe in a devil. He's there anyway. Yes, there's an evil force. Yes, there's an adversary. Your adversary, the devil, the Bible says, seeks whom he may devour. Yes, there are demon forces. Yes, those forces are out there. And before Jesus came, they had authority and power over man. But when Jesus was raised from the dead, he reduced Satan to naught. Five, four, three, two, one. King James says, naught. Nothing. He conquered him. So he took back that authority. When Jesus came to the earth, nobody knew for sure who the Messiah was. They thought maybe it was Moses, maybe it was Joseph, maybe it was David. And then John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And then it was game on. So the first thing Jesus did was the Holy Spirit led him. The devil didn't drag him into the wilderness. The Holy Spirit led him into the wilderness. And it's almost like Jesus was saying, All right, let's settle this once and for all. And so for 40 days, he was tempted. And he won. And he won every time since then. Every time he confronted the devil, he won. Even when they tried to kill him, he said, you can't touch me. Isn't that right? Until he gave his life, nobody could take his life. So he defeated the devil regularly. And then when he was buried, Satan thought he had won, but he was raised from the dead to, to obtain eternal victory, to put away our sins forever. Isn't that right? So the kingdom of God came when the king came. Anywhere Jesus is Lord, the King is there. Do, do, do. That's a creed of the early church. Jesus is Lord. They could have said, not, not Caesar. But it's interesting, when, when Jesus was tempted, he said, the devil said to him, see all of these kingdoms of the earth? I can give you all of this because they were given to me. They were given to him. That's for real. He is the God of this world. But as a Christian, he's no longer your God. He used to be my God. He used to be the one I was serving. I thought I was doing my own thing. And the truth is, my thing was being done to me. I wasn't doing my own thing. I wasn't in control. He could have made me do really anything he wanted me to do. I was completely at his disposal. But when I said, Jesus, you're now king and lord of my heart, it displaced the devil from my life and placed a new king in my heart. And now the kingdom of God is within me. Everybody say, me too. Jesus said to a very religious person, Nicodemus, until you're born again, you can't see the kingdom of God. What does that mean? The kingdom is coming physically. But you know what? It came right now in Jesus. But you don't know it unless you're born again. You can't see it. It was amazing when I became a Christian, how like somebody pulled the curtain back and some things that I've been wondering about for years suddenly made sense. I was like, oh, I get it. That makes sense. Because I could, for the first time in my life, see reality. I could see the kingdom. I was living in the presence of the future. I was living and inhabiting two dimensions. Turn to somebody and say, this sounds like Twilight Zone. But it's true. You as a Christian live in two worlds. Your citizenship is in heaven, but my physical body is here. You're an ambassador from eternity. Your spirit, the real you, is recreated. Beloved, now we are children of God. What we will be is not clear yet. We haven't seen that, but we're going to be like him. So it's coming physically, but it's here now. You say, well, if it's here now, why are there still issues? Well, you either don't know it, or you're not exercising the dominion over the things you can. Because you have authority. You're left as a regent or a co-leader, co-ruler by Jesus Christ. He said, here's my name. Here's my word. Whenever you go, they got to listen to you. I always think about my mom and dad used to give me their credit card when I was in high school and it's time to go back to school. Dad, I think we should do, should do that again. <laughs> I mean, I didn't have a credit card. So I went back, I went off to wherever to buy clothes and I would buy them and I would just say, there it is. 
They didn't care who I was. They had the credit card. I was acting on the behalf of another. They weren't going to come and make me pay. They were coming to make them pay. That's the kingdom. You're a co-regent with the king. The king of the universe sent you here and said, you're in charge. Don't let him con you. He's going to lie to you, but don't listen. Amen? The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. Why did he do that? Why does he want to use us? Somebody said, I think it was Rory said, it's funny that the devil is disarmed and defeated. <laughs> Isn't that good? No feet, no feet, no arms. I like that. <laughs> it's a joke, but you get the point. He has no power unless we give him that power. Isn't that right? I love it when it says in Revelations, I think it's even in Handel's Messiah, it says the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall rule forever and ever. So it's coming, but it came. Amen? It's now and not yet, and we're living in the presence of the future. Once you're born again, you can perceive the reality that's there. I know it sounds like sci-fi. It sounds like Twilight Zone. It's the truth. You have a dimension that's overlaid right in the middle of your life. And it's the kingdom of God existing in the midst of the kingdom of this world. Both are present at the same time. You're living in the presence of the future. You can experience, according to Hebrews, the powers of the coming age. What happens all the time there, you can call on and bring back here, like healing, like miracles, the powers of the coming age. As a follower of Jesus living in the kingdom, you have heaven's resources available to you. Are you guys just listening really good? <laughs> Luke 17, 20 says this. Luke 17, 20. One day the Pharisees asked Jesus, when will the kingdom of God come? Jesus replied, the kingdom of God can't be detected by visible signs. In other words, he said, when it comes the first time, you're not going to see it with your eyes. You've got to see it with the eyes of your heart. You won't be able to say, here it is or it's over there, for the kingdom of God is already among you. The king brought the kingdom. The king defeated the enemy and left the kingdom to his people. The kingdom is here. The kingdom of God is by implication a miracle. Anytime the old king is displaced and driven out and the new king is placed in, that's the kingdom. Whether it's in your heart, in your marriage, in your checkbook, whatever it is, your relationships, anytime the devil's kicked out and the new king comes, that's the kingdom of God. Now, I'm a born-again Christian. I may or may not use the kingdom of God principles in my marriage. I still have the option of saying, no, nah, I think I'm just going to be selfish and go my own way. How many of we still have that option? How many know the king came into my heart, but I can still do stupid stuff? How many guys realize that's true? Don't you wish you could just make the decision? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added. It's a daily decision that you will meet several times throughout every day of your life. Am I going to go kingdom or am I going to go crazy? Am I going to do what God said? Am I going to go with the kingdom? Am I going to seek his kingdom first, live in the kingdom, in the midst of this world, this invisible kingdom? Or am I going to go the way of the world and do what my flesh wants to do? It's a constant decision. Sometimes I make wrong decisions. And when I do, the kingdom of this world rules me. And I repent. By the way, repent just means to change sides. God's side wins Switch sides. Everybody say, switch sides. You all right? He says in, in John 18, verse 36, Jesus answered, my kingdom is not an earthly kingdom. Hmm. What are the implications of that? Let's think about it. I vote. I'm registered to vote. I tell other people to vote. I vote pro-life. I vote biblical values. I vote... What the Bible says, no question about it. I vote what I think the Bible says, the way I should live. Having said that, we're also supposed to be salt and light 
in this world. We should occupy or do business till he comes. You have an opinion, God bless you, use your opinion. You have an option, use it. Be a citizen. But at the end of the day, that's not going to change the world. No matter who put, they put up there or over there, that's not going to change the world. This is going to change the world. If Jesus was going to change the world with the political system, he would have done it himself. Now, that might make some of you mad. Yeah, if we can just, if we can just, has it ever worked? I mean, are you putting your hope in that basket? I pulled up the thing this week and it's like, I don't believe it. They got bars of gold. He's a senator. He's been getting bribed forever. She's in a, she's a, on the other side of the aisle. She's in a theatrical performance doing crazy things that I'm not even going to talk about right here. And it's both sides. And it's like, and then we watched the movie about the Pentagon Papers and shocked me that all the presidents knew that. And I, my conclusion is this. Thank God for America. But, fill in the blank. Fill in the blank. If you're putting your hope in that, don't. Don't. Listen to me, Christians. Don't. That's not the promise. You can make some things better probably with elections, but Jesus went for the heart of the matter. And the heart of the matter is the hearts of people. That's the only thing that's going to bring change. In the meantime, you should live your values out. Do business till he comes. But don't confuse the real game with the distraction. If you're a Christian, you should be voting and speaking. But at the same time, you've got a zillion times more power on your knees in prayer than you ever do in the ballot box. I say do both, but if you have to choose one, you're not from here. You're not from here. You're from another place. God is lending you to this place to bring His law and order until He comes to do it personally. You're an alien and a stranger, the Bible says. Turn to somebody and say, you always look like an alien to me. <laughs> you're an alien and a stranger. You ever been somewhere and your accent doesn't work and they say, you're not from around here, are you? Turn to somebody else and say, you're not from around here. You're from there. You're born again. You have a supernatural miracle that occurred. You personally have power over the devil. You do. Turn to somebody else and say, you do. I know all this participation, but think about it. I'm not going to go there. I don't have time. But Daniel 2, the king sees a, a vision of a statue. And it's four Gentile kingdoms. It represents four Gentile kingdoms having to do specifically with Israel. It's not every kingdom from then on, but it's Gentile kingdoms. It's a statue of a man representing Gentile, the Gentile world. And these four uh, kingdoms are hit by a rock that's cut out and not touched by human hands. It crushes this statue, and it says, uh, the meaning of the rock cut from the mountain by supernatural means crushes the dust of the statue, iron, bronze, clay, and silver, and gold. And here's what it says. In the time of those kings, not after, but right in the midst of the world going crazy, right in the midst of the world doing its thing, right in the midst of that, the God of this world is going to crush these kingdoms. He's going to set up a kingdom then, that shall never be destroyed. Not after, but in the midst of. He set up the kingdom right now in the midst of. The kingdom is here. So what does it mean for me? Well, Jesus said, if I cast out demons with the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come. Amen? So think about this. Where do you need the king to come in your life? Salvation? Your heart? Healing? By the way, Becky and I were visiting Jeremiah and Jessica in Springfield last week. We went to church with them at uh, James River Church. Formerly the Assembly of God, now non-denominational. I think it's well over 10,000 people in all the campuses and all that's going on. And here's what the pastor said. It's so interesting. He said, you know, people are saying to me, why are you guys emphasizing healing so much? Because so many people are getting healed. Why are you emphasizing healing? Isn't it wild that somebody would ask a pastor that? And he said, well, two-thirds of Jesus' ministry was healing, so Jesus kind of emphasized it, so we're just following him. And so he said, uh, we have 
we have, have verified 3,200 plus examples in the last three years of healings. 3,200 verified examples. Not somebody just said, you know, my back was hurting, now it's better. Verified supernatural healings. I left that church and I was talking to Jeremiah, I was talking to Becky, and, and I said, okay, I got to know, what are they doing that we ain't doing? Because we believe exactly what they believe. Why is it working so well? I have an answer. You want to know the answer? Yeah. It's because they give all the testimonies and they've raised the expectation of the people to the point where when they pray, sometimes when we pray, we don't sell, but it's like, yeah, I hope God does something there, you know. Man, this is pretty, pretty wild. I hope God shows up. It's kind of like twinkle, twinkle, little star. Hope God helps you where you are. <laughs> you know, it's, it's the expectation. And so what happens is all of a sudden, the expectation raises, and when, when people are getting prayed for, normal people in the pew are saying, well, yeah, they got cancer. We know three people that got healed of that, yeah. And the expectation of the group is causing miracles. Father, give us that. We ask you in the name of Jesus to increase the expectation, Lord. Do that among us, Lord. Signs, wonders, miracles, healings. Lord, we ask for that in the name of Jesus. Healing is the kingdom of God. Peace in your soul is the kingdom of God. God's authority released into every area of your life where you have responsibility is the kingdom of God. Parenting with God's direction is the kingdom of God. A message of hope of a coming kingdom is the kingdom of God. Your marriage, your finances, your parenting. Think about it. Anything that with which you have to do, the king can rule there. My favorite prayer, one of my favorite prayers is from the Old Testament. I bet I prayed a thousand times a year. It's from the Old Testament where this guy stood up in a group and he said, God, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. Next to my bathroom prayer that I pray before I preach where I say, God, what am I doing here? I'm like a turtle on the fence post. Why did you put me here? Why am I here? Here we are again. Please help me. Next to that, this God, my, I don't know what to do, but my eyes are on you is my favorite prayer. It works, amen? All the things that you have to do with, things that you don't even know what to do, just say, God, I establish the kingdom. Jesus said, pray that way. Come thy kingdom. Be done thy will on earth as it is in heaven. Amen? The kingdom is a man, Jesus. It's a message, the good news of Jesus' victory. And it's a miracle. It's displacing the enemy and placing a new king there. Isn't that good? Wow. Wow. I'm going to skip a whole bunch and we're going to go home on time. That's 1.30, right? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> That's kidding. Jesus can be king in your world even before he's king in the world. His message was change sides. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. By the way, the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God are the same thing. In Matthew, it's called the kingdom of heaven because he was writing to Jewish people and they don't like to say God. But it's exactly the same. One's not future and one's present. It's exactly what I just told you today. There is a future and there is a present. But the term kingdom of heaven and kingdom of God are identical. They mean exactly the same thing. So establish a kingdom in your life now. Submit that area to, of your life to Jesus as a new king. Say, Jesus, you're now king here. Isn't that right? Follow the principles of the kingdom. I'll get into that later. I said this. Jesus launched an invasion against darkness. He placed you behind enemy lines. Will you fight? Amen. He invaded darkness with his kingdom. And he put you behind enemy lines. And the answer is, yeah, it's all the power I need. But the question is, will you fight? Amen. You have to fight the right battle. Stop fighting the puppets. The puppet, uh, you know, the, the things that jump around, the puppets, and fight the puppet master. People are not our problem. It's the one who's jerking those puppets around. Cut the strings. Fight the puppet master. Somebody told me a story. It's great. They said, if you put a bunch of red ants and black ants into a jar, they won't fight. But if you shake them, they'll start eating each other. Well, the issue is not the ants who are fighting. The question is, who's shaking the jar? Amen. That's the problem. Stop shaking that jar. That's the enemy behind the situation. So stop fighting the puppets and stop, and stop the puppet master. I am just praying for a new understanding of authority. 
I'm going to do some things specifically in the coming weeks. And I want you to be thinking about the areas. Okay, where, what's out of control here? Where can I apply the king in my life? Where does the king need to show up? Where does the king need to reign in this part of my life? If it's, if it's your heart, let's fix that right now. If Jesus has never become the king of your heart, I'm going to pray a prayer. It's not this prayer that's going to save you. Maybe you're watching online. Maybe you're here. But it's simply you saying, okay, I was the king of my life. Really, the devil was the king of my life. But I thought I was the king of my life. And so, as of right now, I hand that over to Jesus. If you've never done that, or if you believe it, say this. Father, in the name of Jesus, right now, I turn from my kingdom, my sin, my best efforts, and I submit to a new king. Jesus, be king in my life. I surrender to you. I declare that your Lord, and from this moment forward, my life and my future belong to you. In Jesus' name. Ushers, come on up. That was good. Preach it. <laughs> Father, we thank you for this opportunity to bless your people. And Father, we thank you for those that are giving today. Um, and if you want to be blessed in the Lord, you just, you just put him first. This book is called Stop Staring into Heaven. This is the book that Terry mentioned while he was preaching. So you can get that out in the foyer. If you buy it from the church, the church gets the money. If you yeah. buy it from Amazon, I think they give me a couple bucks. Oh. Uh, so buy it out there. Ten bucks all the time. But uh, we've given away a ton of the heaven books. Yes. Uh, but we're selling these. And we're yes. using the money for good stuff. Yes. Uh, in 1 Samuel 12, it says, Now stand here quietly before the Lord as I remind you of all the great things the Lord has done for you and your ancestors. I'm sure you can think of things that God has done for you and for your loved ones, for your kids, for your grandkids. There's things he's done, and I just want you to just be quiet before the Lord now. Father, thank you. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you for your presence, Father. Somebody's lungs are being healed. God's doing something in someone's lungs. Mm. I don't know what it is, but you can experience a difference today. You're going to be able to breathe a whole lot better. Father, I speak life to whatever that is. Whatever the situation is in those lungs, I speak life there. Lungs be opened, be free in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Father God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your anointing, Lord. Thank you that as we wait upon you and we rest in you, that you would cause supernatural things to happen to us. Whatever the people need, Lord, whatever they need from you, whether it's healing or whether it's uh, as they give, that, that the heavens will be opened up to them to bless them financially. Father, whatever it is, I thank you that your anointing is upon them and your peace is upon them. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Isn't it interesting when you get into the presence of the Lord, he just starts helping people. Yes. Get into God's presence and he just begins to help you. You guys go ahead and serve the people. Let's show that video. We have a video for Serve Day.
like it says, sign up in the foyer. They need lots of volunteers. Let's all stand. I want to also say uh, thank God Jeremy and Aiden made it back safe from Lebanon. Our children's minister and his son made it a home from Lebanon, and they ministered with the Beamers and the work over there in Beirut. Uh, and also, we're having a fall festival. We call it Fall Festival slash Fiesta, uh, October the 25th on a Wednesday night at both campuses. And at this campus, at 7 o'clock, I'm going to be in here with an interpreter. We're going to have a Hispanic interest meeting. If you know anyone who is interested in attending uh, anything, something Hispanic we're thinking about, putting an interpreter back in that room. We have interpreters now. And then giving them headsets. We're praying about what to do. But I want to see how much interest there is. So if you know someone who has an interest, uh, we want to do that. We're looking forward to that. We'll do whatever we need to do to reach people for the Lord. So we'd be praying about that if that's something that you're interested in. I'll probably take a half an hour or so and do it while the, the picnic, the fiesta is going on. Amen. Everybody say, Jesus is alive. I challenge you, over the next few weeks, look in the Gospels at the times the Bible talks about, especially what Jesus said, about the kingdom of God. And be thinking about that. Let's learn to really apply it to our lives. God bless you guys. You're dismissed. Go enjoy this great day.